welcome to Scholars Hub at Home. I am Carrie Williams, Director of Advancement Events at York University. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for today's lecture. It is titled Critical Minerals and the Climate. What is at stake in the Ring of Fire? With Dr. Dana and Scott, Associate Professor, Osgood Hall Law School. Um, Hi, Dana. I'm just going to read um, a few more opening remarks. You're welcome to leave your camera on. We just have a few more remarks to go through. Um, so I accept the responsibility to acknowledge the land I am on because we're not all gathered in the same place. Uh, the land I'm about to acknowledge might not be for the territory you are on. Uh, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the tr traditional territory you are on. And the website native-land.ca is a good resource for this. Uh, as a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the huron -Wendem and it is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Walton Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably care and share for the Great Lakes region. Um, I'd like to share a brief update from the university. Uh, last week, York announced that Kathleen Taylor will serve as the university's 14th chancellor, effective January, 2023. Uh, the first woman to serve as chair of the board of a major bank in Canada, Taylor's, appointments, uh, uh, Taylor's appointment as York's new chancellor also marks the first time a woman will serve in this role. Uh, she's an esteemed York alumna. Taylor holds a Juris Doctor from Osgood Hall Law School and a Master's of Business Admin uh, from the Schubert School of Business. We do look forward to welcoming her back uh, to York in the new year. Also, the fall issue of the York University Magazine launches next week. Uh, we have news and features about York alum, faculty and students, and keep in touch with what your former classmates are up to these days. Uh, visit magazine.yorku.ca um, to read the magazine and subscribe to future issues. But just before uh, we get into introducing Dana, uh, we do like to conduct a quick poll before each session begins. Uh, the question for today is how would you rate your knowledge regarding this topic of today's presentation? So uh, uh, Paul should come out. Oh, great. I see people already responding. That's great. Um, this is always helpful. Um, Dana, you'll, you might find this helpful to know some who's in the audience and what knowledge people are bringing. So uh, this is always a, a fun, a fun exercise. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so it looks like um, uh, the majority of it is minimal, actually, minimal, and, and mi between minimal and somewhat informed. Um, so really glad that you've decided to join us today um, uh, to, uh, to, to learn more. Um, so if you need help with the Zoom webinar at any point, please feel free to cl uh, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and enter your question. Our team is ready to help you. And that same button will be used to submit questions to Dana, our guest speaker, um, during the Q&A period after her lecture. Uh, please note that all your questions and comments are visible to our panelists and our staff working behind the scenes. So we ask you to keep your comments relevant and respectful. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dana Scott. Um, Professor Dana Nadine Scott was appointed as York Research Chair in environmental law and justice in the green economy in 2018. She is cross-appointed with York's Faculty of Environmental Studies and Urban Change. Uh, Professor Scott's research interests focus on uh, contestation over extraction, exercises of indigenous jurisdictions over lands and resources, the distribution of pollution uh, burdens affecting marginalized communities and vulnerable populations, gender and environmental health, and the justice dimensions of the transition to a greener economy. Among other awards, Professor Scott has been a recipient of a York Massey Fellowship, a Fulbright Fellowship, and the Law Commission of Canada's Audacity of Imagination Prize. Uh, so we're so pleased that you're able to join us here today, uh, Dana. Welcome to the Scholars Hub. 
uh, you may feel free to unmute yourself and share your screen and, uh, and take it from here. Okay, thank you very much, Carrie. Uh, that was a lovely way of starting us off. And um, I'm just gonna get my slides going for everyone because I did bring lots of pictures. Um, there we go. I uh, also want to say thank you to Marjan, who's been supporting me in getting ready for this, and just generally uh, to the Scholars Hub team for the invitation. Um, I'm speaking from Toronto, uh, and so in addition to the land acknowledgement that uh, Carrie just made, I'd also like to make another reference to the dish with one spoon wampum. And as she mentioned, that represented a treaty made between Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people to peaceably share the territory surrounding the Great Lakes region. And uh, what I would like to emphasize what Anishinaabe scholar Leanne Betamasaki Simpson has said about the dish with one spoon wampum. She calls it a quote, ancient template for realizing separate jurisdictions within a shared territory. And this, I think perhaps even more than the peaceable sharing aspect of the wampum, which is often emphasized, contains a powerful call to action. And so my larger argument in this work is that we need to find a way, a way to achieve these shared jurisdictions, uh, sorry, separate jurisdictions within a shared territory um, in order to really get to a decolonial constitutional order in Canada and also to achieve climate justice. Uh, but today, I just wanna give you a much quicker overview of what's at stake in the Ring of Fire. So just to quickly introduce myself, um, I'm a settler scholar. I teach in the area of environmental justice. I'm a mom and a law professor. Um, I belong to a collective of scholars who works with community organizers and academics and students uh, with in partnership and alongside um, uh, activists in Treaty 9. And my main collaborators uh, are in Nishtantika First Nation. So I'm indebted to Chief Wayne Munias of Nishtantika, as well as the community's leadership, youth and elders and advisors. So in addition uh, to the land acknowledgements made so far, I also want to acknowledge the Anishinaabe and Oji Cree peoples of Treaty 9 in the Northern Boreal Lowlands, um, who continue to fulfill their responsibilities to steward the lands and waters of the Attawapiskat River watershed in line with their own legal, political, and social orders. And they do so in a way that benefits us all. So that's uh, where I'd like to start off the talk. I had the opportunity to fly over the Attawapiskat River in a float plane this past summer. And as I did so, it became obvious to me why the research collab collaborators I work with in Nishtantika always emphasize that they live on a river system. Below us was a complex patchwork of more water than land, more tributaries than river, a winding, circuitous path of connections and interconnections. And so it became further obvious to me that community members that went ahead of our group that guided the big freighter canoes um, to the community's camp at Beto Lake would have needed to draw on a deep knowledge and experience of their homelands to navigate what they call the lifeblood of their people. It's also kind of drives home the fact that this part of the world uh, contains some of the largest unfragmented wetlands in the world. Uh, that the peatlands here are said to hold an enormous uh, storehouse of carbon that could possibly be released should those unfragmented ecosystems be disturbed. So I was joining a team of invited guests on this river excursion to witness the launch of Nishtantaga's new sturgeon protection program, Nameka Gagige, which means many sturgeon forever in the communities Anishinaabe Moan. Uh, language. Calling the program new, however, holds a certain irony. The Anishinaabe and Anishni peoples of this part of Treaty 9 have been taking care of their relative, the sturgeon, uh, since time immemorial. The fact is, they recently obtained funding to support that work from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, 
based on the fact that Lake Sturgeon of the Hudson Bay, James Bay population is listed under the Species at Risk Act as a species of special concern, meaning they could become endangered in the near future. The delegation of First Nation members and guests on the river were making their way to the site of a proposed crossing of the Attawapiskat uh, by a new mining road said to be necessary to reach the so-called Ring of Fire. So here's a map that I've taken from a recent CBC article. And you can see in red the cluster of mineral deposits uh, that's been given the name the Ring of Fire. It was discovered as far back as 2007 and has had a successive string of governments um, salivating over the prospects for opening up the North to the development of these mineral resources. It's been called Ontario's oil sands and said to be a multi-generational wealth generation opportunity. The mining, uh, the push for the mining in the Ring of Fire recently, however, is glossed in a new green veneer. Proponents now aggressively position this extraction as a necessary part of the coming energy transition, emphasizing that critical minerals are needed for clean tech and the digital economy. So as an example, I'm showing you here a recent World Bank report um, in which it's argued that the transition away from fossil fuels is predicted to be extremely mineral intensive. And so while the initial hype around the Ring of Fire was centered around the mineral chromite, which was thought to be crucial in manufacturing steel and was uh, important for meeting the very high demand for steel to fuel China uh, growth, it's now nickel that's often targeted as an important component of electric vehicle batteries. The indigenous communities that have the most at stake in the extraction of minerals and the attendant infrastructure in the Ring of Fire are thus thrust onto yet another new frontier for extraction. These communities are small, remote First Nations in a constant state of social emergency, enduring what many Indigenous leaders call an ongoing genocide. They include members like those I spoke to on the river this summer, whose relationship to the river and the sturgeon was severed by the trauma of residential schools and government-done day schools. The disruption to the intergenerational transmission of language, laws, and practices on the land is evident even as it's being actively overcome. One elder grandmother who made it to the Beto Lake camp this summer said it was important for her to come along as someone who carries the water and someone who has responsibilities to take care of the river for future generations. Chief Munias observed that on the river, the community was calm, Ceremonies were performed, people could relax and share, reflect and laugh together. But back on the reserve in Nishtantaga, daily life is made hard by a chronic underfunding of basic services. This is manifest in youth suicide and addiction crises, substandard and overcrowded housing, and a persistent lack of access to clean drinking water. Nishtantaga's boil water advisory, as many will have heard, is the longest in the country standing at over 10,000 days or 27 years. So the community exists in this state of limbo, always anticipating the major changes that are promised to be coming, yet their daily existence is marked by a distinct lack of any meaningful progress towards mitigation of the ongoing social emergency. With the mining now positioned as critical to the energy transition, addressing the climate crisis and building a clean economy, government announcements emphasize inclusion and partnership, progressive social plans for bringing Canada's First Nations into prosperity by enlisting them in the production of batteries for electric cars. Canada's Minister of Natural Resources, Jonathan Wilkinson, says that there is no energy transition without critical minerals. The governing Liberals' Minds to Mobility strategy aims to attract investments that build up Canada's battery supply chain from mining and processing raw materials to assembling electric vehicles. Even Ontario's Premier Doug Ford, who once mocked electric vehicles as, quote, Teslas for millionaires, now sees that mining can be linked to the province's auto sector strategy, all the while being climate friendly. And with this, it seems that any tension between the Prime Minister and Premier Ford is dissipated. 
citing the fact that global conflict, namely the war in Ukraine, is exacerbating supply chain vulnerabilities, governments in Canada are now united around building strategic alliances for supplying critical minerals to the automotive sector, national defense, and clean technologies. It's really important to understand that critical minerals do not fall into a scientific or technical category, but rather are politically designated as such in a specific geopolitical context linked to notions of scarcity and national security. Currently in Canada, political interest in critical minerals is linked to a trade agreement with the United States aimed at securing a stable North American battery supply chain. U.S. President Biden's last-minute transformation of the Build Back Better Act into the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act is said to be, quote, part industrial strategy, part climate plan, and part social justice, all with a protectionist bent. What it means for Canada is still unfolding, but it seems clear that it will provide major incentives for electric vehicles to be built in North America so consumers can access the tax credit and also for the vehicle's batteries to be built from minerals sourced in North America. Enter the mining company Wailu Metals, a subsidiary of Tatarang owned by billionaire Andrew Forrest, nicknamed Twiggy, who made his fortune mining iron ore with the Fortescue Metals Group. Wailu Metals recently acquired Norant and now holds the vast majority of mining stakes in the Ring of Fire. The Wailu CEO, recently stated the following in his opening pitch to the Matawa chiefs. Quote, the Ring of Fire is home to expansive deposits of future-facing metals, making this a once-in-a-generation opportunity to be part of the Green Revolution. Working hand-in-hand -hand with First Nation and regional partners, we'll develop the Ring of Fire into Ontario's great minical, one of Ontario's great mineral districts that will be pivotal in the world's transition to a lower carbon future. So my questions are, how should we think about extraction in this new shade of green? It's clear that the new green economy will have its sacrifice zones and its wastelands, just as the fossil era did. That there are and will continue to be vast disparities in relation to who will reap the benefits and who will shoulder the burdens of our collective efforts to meet our needs and wants, and even in our collective efforts to save ourselves from the worst of climate calamity. So let's take a step back. In 2011, negotiations began between Ontario and the Matawa First Nations, a collection of nine communities close to the Ring of Fire deposits and likely to be impacted by the infrastructure needed for its development. Those negotiations were built on the solid foundation of a unity declaration, insisting that the nine communities were one nation and would stand together as a reflection of their pre-existing and continuing jurisdiction over their homelands. Despite this principled start, however, the province and industry began in 2017, signing deals with communities one by one, such that the situation today is a mishmash of discrete environmental assessments being put forward by individual First Nation road proponents who are uncomfortably sandwiched between the industry and state boosters of extraction in the region. A few communities in the heart of the Attawapiskat River watershed, like Nishtantaga, are stubbornly clinging to a different notion of their people's futures on the land, their legal obligations to protect it, and their political authority to decide. As of now, the divide and rule strategy appears as if it will prevail, although the story is clearly not over. Namaka Gagi Gay, Nishtantaga's Sturgeon Protection Project, is just one manifestation of a widespread resurgence of Indigenous laws and cultural practices and expressions of inherent jurisdiction that are spreading across the far north and beyond. Sturgeon can live over 100 years and travel hundreds of kilometers in their lifetimes. They represent an important food source for the community and hold great cultural and spiritual significance. This past August on the Attawapiskat River, ceremony accompanied the harvesting of sturgeon, which were then carefully cleaned and packed to be sent back to nourish elders and their families in the community. 
From Nishantika's perspective, the critical minerals angle is just the latest in a long chain of rationales that have been strung out to justify extraction in their homelands. On the river, it was obvious that, that there is a very deep rift between the principles on which Nishantika stewards its homelands, principles of reciprocal relationality with lands, waters, and other beings, and extractive logics in which elements of the earth are understood to be resources presumed to exist for the sole purpose of enriching humans. Indigenous legal orders include not just the right to take, but also obligations to protect and steward. And this poses a direct challenge to extractivism and thus to the universal application and legitimacy of settler law, particularly in areas like the far north that are exclusively occupied by Indigenous peoples. In fact, this challenge is now forcefully expressed as one of a conflict of laws, with Indigenous peoples pointing to their own pre-existing, still operating and always evolving legal orders as the source of their obligations to protect and defend the land. This is a picture of the Attawapiskat River close to the proposed uh, crossing site for the Northern Road Link, uh, which would lead uh, from the provincial highway network to the Ring of Fire uh, future mine. And um, this mining road, of course, would include a bridge to cross the Attawapiskat River in the heart of Nishtantika's homelands. As Chief Wayne Munias states, quote, our ancestors are buried throughout our homelands, and there are many sacred and ceremonial sites located throughout the Attawapiskat watershed. It's essential that these areas remain undisturbed, as they are an integral link between Nishtantika's past, present, and future. The ceremonies connect us with our past and are part of an ongoing process of revitalizing, preserving, and engaging with our culture, and are vital to the future well being of Nishtantika and the continued protection of the land itself. In Canada, the fact that the untapped mineral deposits are inevitably found on Indigenous lands, coupled with the sheer volume and fast pace at which they would need to be extracted, means that a collision is coming between surging Indigenous rights movements, backed by international norms, such as a community's right to grant or withhold their free prior and informed consent to an extractive project on their homelands, and the minerals for climate action vision. In other words, a collision between these, in, these indigenous rights movements and norms and the minerals for climate action uh, vision that is driving the push for supply chains and electric vehicle uh, batteries. So what I wanna leave you with is just a couple of questions. Uh, what does a just transition to a net zero economy look like in this context? What does it look like in particular places and for particular peoples? And you know what my experience on the Attawapiskat River has uh, shown to me is that there are different visions for the future of um, the, the boreal lowlands uh, in, in the Northern part of Ontario also uh, referred to as the Ring of Fire. And it's, you know, it's not obvious which vision will win out at this point, but nor is it also from an environmental justice perspective, obvious which path to take. So um, I'm happy to answer people's questions. I hope that gives you a good sense of what's at stake in the Ring of Fire. And uh, I look forward to your interventions. Thank you. Okay. Hey. Uh, thank you so much, Dana. That um, uh, thank you also for sort of adding more context to the land acknowledgement, as well as acknowledging the people um, in Treaty Nine that you're collaborating with. Um, this is uh, such a, a such a demonstration of all the intersections, you know, all the mm -hmm. intersections of um, uh, equity and environment, and every, it's a lot of what a lot of us are talking about right now. Things are connected. We're very connected, yeah. and this is a, a really powerful demonstration of that. So, thank you so much. Um, you can feel free to stop sharing your screen. Um, sure. We do now have time for questions. Uh, you pose some questions to us as an audience. Um, um, I'll say to the audience to please use the Q and A button um, at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. Uh, if 
For those of you who are watching live on Facebook right now, you can submit any questions through the comments, um, the comments um, section of the video, and, and the team will send them my way. Um, okay, um, so just wanted to get start here. Um, just one of the things, you sort of, came to sort of towards the end talking about there's a collision coming and and that there are multiple visions for that region, the ring of fire. Could you just talk a little bit more about about those multiple visions, a little bit more mm -hmm. detail on that? Sure. Um, you know, so one of the things that I didn't spend a lot of time talking about um, is the fact that, you know, Many First Nations, not many, uh, two specifically First Nations in the region have also signed on as supporters of uh, the Ring of Fire project's development and in particular have become proponents for the purpose of environmental assessment of the roads that would lead to the Ring of Fire. Um, in part, those communities support, support those roads because they always wanted uh, community roads. Um, being a remote First Nation obviously has, you know, exacerbates many challenges and problems. Uh, so people seek connection because they want um, easier access to health care, um, make it easier for them to visit friends and family, uh, for them to get a more affordable food or other kinds of equipment to the community. So there are lots of good reasons to support uh, community access roads. And so it's true that in the communities themselves, there is division over whether those roads are a good thing or not. Um, other people worry about what comes along with the roads. So things like um, um, other uh, settlers accessing the territory for hunting and fishing, for example, or we know that there are major risks to indigenous women and girls that come with industrial work camps, and the roads uh, leading to those work camps in terms of uh, sexual violence, for example. Um, there are people worried about drugs and alcohol affecting their remote communities um, that could be exacerbated by um, access roads. So there are a whole lot of changes. Um, and as I mentioned in Nishantika, they worry about the actual disruption to the Attawapscat River watershed and the sturgeon. And, um, the environmental impacts related to the uh, mining and the roads. So there would be, you know, there would be different set of visions within communities. I think from the communities that want the access roads and are in support of the ring of fire, the striking thing is that everyone speaks about um, the future for their children and their grandchildren. Everyone is um, justifying their position on the grounds that it's what they think is best for the futures of their community. And I think that's very compelling, um, but those are different visions. And, um, you know, I think in Ontario, we need to question whether or not our wish to have um, electric vehicles to be able to keep driving the way we drive in private vehicles as much as we do um, justifies the need to disrupt um, this territory, these ways of life, these ecosystems. Um, and for us to feel good about it and to think we're doing it as part of a climate change measure, uh, I think needs to be complicated. Yeah. So complex, <laughs> so, so complex. And I, I'm curious about, actually, we have some questions. Let me get to those and I'll get to mine in a minute. Um, so we have a question from David, um, and David says, terrific presentation. Um, are you optimistic that a mutually acceptable and responsible solution is out there and can be found? It's a big question. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, I think there are two things that we need to try to tackle. One is the question of free prior and informed consent. So this is, as I said, a standard in international law. The federal government has implemented legislation to enact what we call the UNDRIP, um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. They say they're committed to it. And so we need to figure out how we can actually implement free prior and informed consent in Canadian law. This means that very first hurdle 
well, we are not going to do this mining unless the communities impacted by this want the mining. To me, that's kind of like the bottom line. Then we have further questions. Um, how should they benefit from it, for example? So the kind of underlying constitutional assumptions that we have today that we live with, uh, the provinces own all of the mineral resources and all of the crown land within the province. Um, and therefore, you know, companies can decide whether they want to share some of those um, profits from those enterprises with communities. We call these impact benefit agreements. We're also seeing a lot of equity stakes deals being done across the country uh, where communities would actually be owners of the projects in their territories or part owners usually. Um, you know, those questions of who should benefit. So there's the, there's like a governance authority question. Should communities be able to decide what projects are gonna be located in their territories? And should they benefit? How should they benefit from those projects? Um, so there is a way forward, I think. Um, and it could be that if communities had the governing authority and they were gonna be the ones benefiting from the mining, uh, they may decide that mining for critical minerals to assist in the transition to electrification is part of their vision, right? So maybe that's one way forward. Um, maybe other people will disagree and still think that, you know, the, the fragmentation to the boreal is, is too risky or the release of carbon from the peatlands is, is too much for the climate and it's not gonna be outweighed by the benefits of switching to electrification, for example. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a number of questions coming in, so just sort of prioritizing where I'm going to go here. Sure. Um, so with, uh, with the upcoming election, are we seeing different parties having different visions? And which vision is most sustainable? Ooh. Um, federal election we're talking about, or? Um, I don't didn't know. Say, didn't say. I mean, there's a municipal one, but that wouldn't impact that. Yeah. I didn't say. I didn't say. Well, it doesn't matter, really. Um, you know, part of the point I was trying to make is that you know, here we are seeing a Premier Ford and the Prime Minister on the same page about something, and that's relatively, at yeah. least, has been relatively unique in the past few years. Um, you know, and that's that's partly related to, uh, I think, what makes this issue also difficult for the NDP, maybe that's what you're asking. Uh, it's probably also clear that uh, even an NDP government would support mining in the ring of fire uh, because of the way that the electric vehicles and the batteries supply chains are so important to the automotive sector, which of course is important to organized labor and, and has been sort of foundational to the NDP. Um, it's very difficult to see a way forward uh, for a party to kind of um, turn its back on this quote unquote opportunity. What I would say is that we should be able to see parties differentiate themselves on the basis of whether they support free prior and informed consent as a standard and how they wanna engage with indigenous communities um, in order to kind of gain uh, what some people call the social license in order to do the extraction, right? So parties may differ in terms of how they would approach those negotiations, I would say. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so you have another question from uh, Paul. And he sets, uh, Paul sets some context and then gets to his question. So this will be so I've understood that there is a formative plan for a lithium processing facility on the Fort William First Nation. But I've heard firsthand from a geologist who said that lithium mining will never happen. Have you heard anything about this? Would it be because lithium is a whole lot easier to recover from deposits elsewhere, or perhaps because battery technology will likely have moved on from lithium before this infrastructure could be up and running? Hmm, good question. I don't really know. I haven't heard a lot about lithium deposits um, in the far north, obviously elsewhere. It's a major um, part of the critical minerals discussion. I haven't heard much a bit about it in the far north. I didn't know about this proposal for Fort William. And uh, But the point you raise is a really good one in terms of um, the timing, right? So 
Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's well over a decade that people have been talking about trying to figure out a way to get the minerals out of the ring of fire. Um, without the infrastructure, it makes the project very difficult and expensive, right? Like billions of dollars for that road. So, um, so what that means is that um, community or companies are sort of speculating, right? They, you know, maybe why Lou is holding um, Eagle's Nest, which is the main mining deposits in the Ring of Fire, you know, just to see what transpires over the next few years. Like, as I mentioned, you know, the geopolitics is playing a big part in this, right? And things are shifting constantly. The technology is always shifting. It's really hard to predict what metals are going to be important in 10 years, for example. And it's going to take us 10 years to get this infrastructure approved and built. So, um, so for sure, all of those moving pieces are part of part of the dynamic making things even harder in the region. Um, thank you for that. On one of your slides, you had um, identified a number of sources uh, for to build these batteries. A number of uh, uh, you had flags representing countries as right. going. Um, so, and I'm just curious if there's any what's happening in those countries and those communities where um, there is uh, the potential of mining or mining's mining's already started there. What mm -hmm. what land are they on? What mm -hmm. communities are they impacting? And is there mm -hmm. any connection between happening? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, I think part of what's happening is the you know, these kinds of debates are happening around the world, as you're probably noticing. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of critical minerals mining um, in Latin America, which is heavily contested in similar ways and different ways than it is in Canada. There certainly is kind of um, a renewed push towards discussions about nationalization um, in the sense that uh, countries are really trying to figure out how do they um, get a corner on and protect these supply chains. They're making strategic decisions about that. Um, and of course, nationalization is contested, uh, you know, in, in the Latin American context, also in Canada, et cetera. Um, Biden's um, Inflation Reduction Act is interesting, of course, because it has a made in America kind of component that uh, Canada, you know, it seems lobbied hard in order to get Canada included in the definition of America so that we could also um, build cars that would be subject to those rebates and we could also source minerals that would create batteries that would uh, fall under that act and its incentives. Um, there, are, you know, there are major uh, human rights <clears throat> implications for mining in different parts of the world. So many people will know about cobalt mining in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, you know, which is rife with human rights abuses, including child labor and lots of contamination problems. And so there have been measures uh, taken at the international level and in various mining codes of conduct to avoid um, uh, supply chains that include, quote unquote, conflict minerals. Um, the term, you know, applies in that context um, and not as well in other contexts, but the idea that we have to think about human rights when we're um, not just environmental effects, but also human rights when we're mining and that those supply chain um, issues are really important is I think that's affecting it, the situation globally. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. I um, This is it's so fascinating and um, such critical information. And it just, it will be interesting to see sort of um, either when the collision happens or when the decisions are made, just sort of what it's going to say about how we how we respond to what we value in this country, mm -hmm. you know, like what, you know, it's going to say something about who we are. And um, mm -hmm. uh, it's very interesting. It'll be very interesting to see for sure. Um, so thank you. That's all the time we have for questions. Yeah, now. okay. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, this lecture is recorded and I'll be watching it again. <laughs> um, um, but thank you so much. You're welcome to turn your video off now if you, if you would like. Bye, thank you. Okay, take care.
Um, for those of you who'd like to share today's session, like I said, uh, we will be posting it on our YouTube page. Uh, that's at youtube.com slash Yorkie alumni. Um, you can also watch any of the past lectures that you may have missed. Um, really interested in hearing your response to our next question, um, given uh, Dana's talk. Um, how would you rate your knowledge now um, after her talk? Uh, it should pop up on your screen um, right now. Um, our next Scholars Hub at home session is called uh, Ecosyn, uh, sorry, Ecosynography, Ecosynography in the Global Classroom, Creating Sustainable Worlds for Theatre Through International Collaboration, taking place Wednesday, October 26th, with Ian Garrett, Associate Professor of Ecological Design and Performance in the School of Arts, Media, Performance and Design. Um, we uh, quickly, I will share that um, our audience has shared Dana that their knowledge has either uh, much improved or somewhat improved. Um, so quite a bit of uh, positive results there. Um, you can register and learn more about upcoming sessions at yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. Uh, until then, thank you again for joining us today and keep well.